Okay. I'm giving a talk to the Houston Functional Programming Meetup Group. I think that's their name, something like that. On February 21st, I think that's the date. Um, <clears throat> so I started thinking, well, I better start preparing for this talk um, because it's going to be on a topic that I haven't spoken on about before. It's going to be on a new relational language <clears throat> um, that's not mini Kenrin. That's somewhat mini Kenrin inspired, but that's different. So I better think about that language because it doesn't exist yet. Uh, sort of like Fogus's suggestion of writing programs and languages that don't exist. Um, so I need to think about that. But it also just made me start thinking, yeah, you know, for preparing for a talk or giving a talk or watching a talk, you know, how do I, how do I think about these things? What's my philosophy? And I thought I would just share a few thoughts. Uh, I've given a lot of talks. Some of them were well received. Some of them uh, much less so. Let's say and I've given some talks that really bombed. Uh, but I've just given a lot of talks and. <clears throat> You know, I guess my first thought is, you know, give a lot of talks. Um, and that's advice to myself and it's advice to anyone else who wants to become good at giving talks. I mean, it's not, it's not magic. Um, if you are a school teacher or if you're teaching undergrads or grad students or whatever, you know, that counts as a certain type of public speaking. You know, when I was involved in summer camps, you know, as a cabin leader or camp director or the different positions I had, I did a ton of public speaking. You know, to me, anytime I was speaking to a group of people, that w that counted. That was like a, a mini talk, you know, some type of public speaking. I was up in front of an audience and had their attention. When I was a public school teacher, same thing. In fact, there I had, I was speaking in front of an audience at least probably four hours a day, every day, you know, like five days a week. So that was a tremendous amount of experience, very, very concentrated. And, you know, anything that could go wrong did go wrong at least once or twice or five times. So I just got a lot of experience in kind of what what went wrong. And so, you know, uh, public speaking, teaching, leading groups, you know, talks to small groups. They all count. All that counts. So that experience adds up. It's true that if you want to give a talk on some technical aspect of a programming language, let's say, to a group of specialists or academics or whatever, you know, that's a different audience and a different venue probably. However, you know, just just being comfortable speaking goes a very long way and having a lot of experience and understanding things like, oh yeah, audio visual problems can happen. You know, um, if you have slides, how do you want to do those? You know, how do you not want to do those? Um, you know, knowing what you do about your audience, how are you going to customize the talk to that audience? How do you deal with things like time management? Time management is really critical. Um, so I, I would say if I give one one piece of advice is um, including to myself is just give a lot of talks. Now this is one area where I think the internet changes things. Okay. <clears throat> 
And, you know, this YouTube series, I think, is a good example <clears throat> where, um, you know, I, I was starting to write about this in book one, but when I was getting started and started in graduate school at Indiana, you know, I really was excited about scheme and functional programming and all these things. And I wanted to get experience telling, talking to people about it. I mean, it wasn't even so much I wanted experience. I just wanted to talk about those things I cared about. And so before I started grad school, you know, if there was a group of people who would get together to talk about languages or whatever, I would, you know, want to join that group and talk to people. Um, and then at grad school, I started, you know, trying to give ad hoc talks if I could get a room somewhere and get an audience. You know, <clears throat> if I can get five people in a room and here's a whiteboard, you know, that's it. That's all I needed. Um, and then when I was a teaching assistant or assistant instructor, you know, I was doing recitation si uh, sessions, so I got more experience and I had, had sort of an audience there, although what I could talk about was constrained by the class. And then over time, I was giving, you know, sort of lectures in the programming languages class when I couldn't, or sorry, when the instructor couldn't be there. And then after I got my PhD, I was teaching some courses. Um, so over time, I was able to ramp that up. And then also at some point, I was talking about Mini Canron and people started inviting me to give talks. And, uh, you know, I would give talks at research colloquia that were in the research group I was part of, all those things. And you could see this sort of ramping up over time. Although when I stopped teaching, you know, in some sense that went down. <clears throat> But it, it you know, took a long time and I had to be a teaching assistant. I had to have access to a research group or programming languages seminar at a university. You know, I, I sort of had to, to scramble to get my opportunities to talk. And then also if someone wanted me to give a talk, you know, I was waiting, <clears throat> you know, I, I wasn't waiting, waiting, but you know, there, there were just a certain number of times a year I'd be asked to talk. It's like, okay. If I get asked to talk once a year, I'm going to give one talk like that. If I ask, if I'm asked to call to talk five times a year, I give five talks. Um, but you know that was largely out of my control. But with the internet, things are different. So you know I'm going to make a thousand twenty-four YouTube videos this year, or at least that's my goal. And I I can view every single one of these as an example or experience talking. And if I wanted to, you know, I could turn each one basically into a talk and treat it as it, as if it were a talk, you know, this talk I'm giving right now was basically a, a, a talk about talks, right? So I don't have to wait for someone to invite me. I don't have to wait to teach a course. I don't have to wait to join a symposium series and then, you know, try to sign up at least once each semester, you know, and hope that, hope I get a slot. You know, I can make as many videos as I want. I can give as many talks as I want. Now, that doesn't mean I have an audience, but I never was guaranteed to have an audience anyway, unless I was teaching. So um, that's fine. And like the old go adage, lose your first hundred games as quickly as possible, you know, give your first hundred terrible talks as quickly as possible. You know, that's that sort of thing. You know, try to make each talk as good as you can make it. But that motto of my next one will be better. You know, that is a way to improve just by lots and lots of practice. And over time, you will figure out what works for you. The other thing that I would advocate is... would be to let your own style come through. I, I think this will happen, part of it will happen automatically if you just give lots of talks. Um, your style might come through even if you don't want, want it to happen, uh, but you can lean into your style at least some over time. And you know, you, you don't have, your talk doesn't have to be the same as everyone else's. You don't have to do the same thing as everyone else's, you know, they're, there are almost no rules. 
and giving a talk. You know, um, don't go over time. <laughs> it's one of the few rules. Okay, so that's that's something I would consider a rule, especially if there's a talk series. If there are a bunch of talks during, you know, an hour and a half session for a workshop, let's say, if you go over, you are taking someone else's time. So don't go over. On time, um, you know, try not to insult the audience. You know, there, there are things like that uh, that I probably don't have to tell you. Or if you're going to insult them, you know, maybe it's in the sense of, hey, we're still using this technique. We should move past it. And then it's sort of a funny, you know, dig at people, including yourself. You know, you can do it with humor in such a way that's not insulting, even though in some sense you're you're making a criticism. Um, but besides things like that, there are basically no rules. You know, show up on time. You know, be ready. You know, there are just some basic things about showing up and basic common courtesy to the person who's organizing things. You know, I'm, but in terms of the actual presentation style, there are basically no rules. Every once in a while, you'll you'll give a talk for some venue, and they require you get to give slides. Certain government agencies require you not just to give slides, but to give certain types of slides. You have to have a slide that has this format, like a quad slide. There, there are things like that. Well, okay, well then in that talk, you're going to have slides, and you're going to have a quad quad chart uh, slide that's just required. So you, it's important to know that sort of thing. But in general, most talks are, are much more freeform. And over time, you will develop your own style if you allow yourself. Now, I've seen people who, you know, haven't given enough talks for their style to develop, or maybe they're convinced somehow there's only one way to give a talk, or, you know, they watched a bunch of talks and they think that's the one way to do it. Um, and, you know, hopefully if they give more talks, they'll get past that. But, uh, you know, th there is a certain type of least common denominator talk, which is, okay, here's a bunch of slides, you know, slide, every uh, fifth slide is a meme, you know, here's an image macro with a funny cat, and that's it, okay? So it's an otherwise unremarkable talk without inspiration. It's just one slide after another, uh, and then every once in a while is an image macro. I've seen so many of those talks that I couldn't even tell you. I mean, just in one one conference I went to, I probably saw 15 of those talks in one day. And for every single one of those talks, it's like, okay, this is someone who I think hasn't given a lot of talks. Um, but they also, this is someone who thinks that's the way you give a talk. Like it has to be done that way. And it didn't, you know, I couldn't have told you afterwards you know, who, who did what, they, they all seemed interchangeable to me. Um, now what I will say is that anything done to, you know, w with sufficient style and confidence as, as, um, uh, Neil, Neil, uh, Gaiman would say, you know, that's okay. Right. So if someone is really an expert on how to make hilarious, uh, image macros that people remember that actually bring bring forth the point and they do it in a creative way with style and confidence, then that works. And, you know, Gary, Gary Bernhardt's Watt talk, for example, well, that's all like image macro and meme things. But his, his point comes through, I think, very clearly about the design of programming languages where the, these Watt aspects of them so, you know, it wasn't that he gave a standard talk and every fourth or fifth slide for an otherwise unremarkable talk was an image macro. His whole talk was image macros and funny pictures, but there was nothing in that talk that I would remove or change. I think that talk was, was awesome. Um, and so he, he, you know, figured out what his style was going to be for that talk and, you know, came up with a classic. So 
I'm not saying you can't have image macros, but what I'm saying is there is a type of cookie cutter talk, which is like, you know, and if, if you haven't seen a bunch of talks at a tech conference, um, I ask the next time you watch, see how many of the talks are like this. Um, like I said, I, I think there's a large, a large number of those talks that happen. Um, I guess my point isn't, isn't to criticize those talks, although I am critical of them, it's to say that, you know, if that's what you think a talk has to be, I'm saying that it's not. It's, a talk doesn't have to be that. A talk doesn't have to be any one style. It could, could be a totally different style. And, you know, figure out what your talk needs and make the talk that's necessary. And, you know, as far as the rules go, you don't have to use slides. I've seen great talk. Some of the best talks I've ever seen had no visuals at all. It's just someone talking, you know, um, I, there was a anthropology professor I saw all of his, his lectures were just him standing at the front of a stage with his toes over the edge of the stage with his hands in his pocket, talking in a monotone voice for the entire time with no visuals. And that, he was the best speaker I've ever seen. I would do anything I could to avoid missing his class uh, because what he was saying was so fascinating. His insights were so fascinating. That's a perfect example. Or there are some uh, series, lecture series on, you know, Greek philosophy that I've seen that are, that are like that one person at a podium just talking. Or um, I, I saw a talk uh, by the Connections author, uh, James Burke, where it was just him at a podium talking. It was completely fascinating. So you don't have to have any slides at all to give a fantastic talk. Now, if you're talking about something highly technical where visuals help, diagrams help, maybe that's a, a great thing, okay? But just remember that you know, the world survived with blackboards and chalk for a very long time with people being able to communicate clearly or overhead projectors, you know, after that. And so, you know, you don't have to have super fancy transitions or movies or, or whatever. And you certainly don't need image macros to, to give a great talk. Um, so anyway... My, my point is your talk can be different than how other people do it and be great. And in fact, if you watch really great talks, they almost always are doing things that are different than, you know, what a standard talk would do or what standard advice is. In fact, whatever the advice is for giving a talk, you can change any of those things. Okay. You can change any of those things um, and, and give a great talk. So it's not... It's just not necessary. And, you know, part of this is, you know, the slides are not a talk. Okay, that's very important to understand. A deck of slides is not a talk. It's just not. And it's also important to understand that a talk is a performance. Okay. It's a live performance. So a, a deck of slides is not a live performance. So every once in a while, someone say, hey, I heard you give a talk. Can you send me your slide deck? And I say, no, I can't send you my slide deck because I don't have one because I didn't have any slides. I've got an Emacs transcript maybe, you know, for some of these. Every once in a while I have some slides, but the slides themselves probably aren't going to be very helpful. It's like, okay, here are some slides. Uh, every single slide had five minutes of commentary to go with it. You know, so here's a slide of, you know, an ancient cuneiform tablet. And I talked about that tablet in the context of modern media and how we can lose information. And I gave a, you know, five minute mini talk about that. And that's not, uh, that's not a bunch of slides with bullet points. So I can't give you the slide deck that makes sense. Right. So slides are not a talk. And a talk is a live performance. I think those are really critical. 
Um, another thing is, I'll say, I, I think of a Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you're not sure what that is, uh, please look it up for talks. Okay. So, you know, the, the Maslow's idea was that there, there are certain things that you need to have, like you need the ability to breathe. Okay. And then if you have the ability to breathe, then you need water, you know, and if you have water, then you need food. And then if, uh, if you have food, you need shelter. There are certain things that you need just to survive. And then as it goes up in the hierarchy, you go beyond just raw survival to being able to accomplish higher goals and, you know, plan over time and collaborate with other people to achieve uh, things like that. And then maybe artistic works and so forth. And then there's a self-actualization. And then supposedly I've read there's an even higher phase that you never fully articulated. But in any case, I think of something like that for talks. So, you know, the base level is show up where you need to be when at the right time. Okay. Now that might be, that might sound obvious, but uh, that's not always easy to do. And especially if you're giving a talk, maybe an international talk or a talk in some location you've never been to before, right? Um, that might be hard. Or if you're jet lagged, you know, that, that could be really tricky. Um, so I've almost not shown up for talks at the the right time at the right place many times. And I think I have missed a couple over the years. Um, but that that is kind of the base level, okay? You got to show up where you need to be at the right time. Doesn't mean you have to be rusted. You could be exhausted. You could be jet lagged. But you at least have a chance of giving a good talk. If you show up at the wrong place or if you don't show up at all or if you show up after everyone has left, well, then you have zero chance of giving a good talk, okay? So that's the, the baseline thing. And then make sure the audience can hear you. That's the next level. So if you are maybe doing an online talk and you're having microphone problems, Audience can't hear you. Well, it's probably not going to be a great talk if the audience can't hear you. Or if you're in an auditorium and you're not using, or a big room and you're not using a microphone and people in the back can't hear you, or maybe there are a bunch of other things going on. Like I've, I've certainly been to many conferences where, you know, the conference is in a hotel ballroom and there's a kitchen behind and you can hear, you know, people clanking, the glasses and trays and all that is actually quite loud. And here, you know, if you're sitting next to the door, then you're hearing all these glasses and metal trays smash into each other. And then you're trying to listen to the speaker. And so if the, if the um, volume isn't sufficient or if the PA system isn't set up well, the acoustics in the room are bad it's just going to be really hard and you're going to be super distracted the the entire time you're listening to it. You know, if, if there's lots of reverb in the room, that could be hard. If the microphone's cutting in and out, I gave a talk um, at one conference where the microphone kept cutting off the uh, wireless mic. And I told the organizers I wasn't going to give a talk until they gave me a wired microphone. And they gave me a wired microphone, which meant I had to sit. I couldn't walk around but the microphone worked perfectly and I gave a talk that people liked and, you know, it's on the internet. So I'd had a fair number of views now. So, um, you know, but, but the, the talks before that, the microphone kept going out and I knew this is going to be a disaster. And, and, you know, if nothing else, even the audience who was in the room, forget the recorded part, even for the audience in the room, it was super distracting because even if you could hear, the person speaking, if you're close enough to hear them, you know, you, you would hear them talking in normal voice and then here's booming voice from the PA system. It was extremely disruptive. So they, the audience has to be able to hear you.
Okay, uh, make sure the audience can see you. They don't have to see you or slides, you know, Emacs or whatever you're doing. Um, if you're doing something, now, if you're doing the podium thing, right? Or if you're doing the anthropology teacher who's just standing there with his hands in his pockets, well, then they don't have to see you. I mean, it's nice to see the person, but it's not strictly necessary. You're not seeing me when I'm making this. Um, but if you have slides, if you are live coding, you know, if you have anything like that with visuals, if you're showing a movie or whatever, uh, the audience has to be able to see you. You know, this is the same as the audience has to be able to hear you. Now, the difference is, the reason I put the audience has to hear you at a lower level, that's more basic, is if the audience can hear you but can't see you, you still have a chance to communicate your message because, well, now it's radio, okay? Um, or now it's an obstructed view talk. So that can still be effective. And like I said, for some, some types of talks, it's not really any less effective. But if you're making heavy use of slides with diagrams and things like that, well, obviously it's gonna be an issue. Some of the problems I've seen, well, first of all, okay, so with all of the things I'm talking about, you might imagine that when you're giving a talk, it's in a auditorium with perfect acoustics and this brand new digital projector with a brand new bulb on a giant screen, uh, all those sorts of things. And in practice, it may be more like, hey, you're giving this talk in a dining room or a cafeteria or, you know, a hallway. I've given talks in hallways before, um, you know, all sorts of situations like that. Well, let's say a ballroom for like a conference where the lights are on and you have a little portable projector and the portable projector is like at a weird angle because of the way the seats are. So, you know, it's not really optimal. And you have a little tiny portable screen um, and the light bulb may or may not be new. In fact, there's a chance the light bulb may burn out during the presentation, in which case then someone has to run off and try to find an AV tech support person to try to fix things up as your time is running down. Um, but, you know, it may be that, that the slides are already washed out and if you pick a color scheme that is, say, yellow on white, light yellow on white, or something like that, or brown on black, uh, I, I've seen all sorts of color schemes that have almost no contrast. And under these situations, you know, it's almost impossible to read the text. Maybe if you're in the middle of the front row, or maybe if you have excellent eyesight from you know, the, the, you know, fourth row back, you might be able to read it, but someone in the back is not going to have any chance to read it unless they're, they're an eagle or something. And you've just made it harder for no reason. Okay. So you've, you've made it harder. You've, especially if you use a small font, low contrast, um, people sometimes use templates that are fancy where, I mean, this one drives me up the wall where, you know, there are these big borders so that only a small part of the text or sorry, only a small part of the slide has text or they'll show things in in the um, like preview mode for their slides if they're using Excel or Keynote or something. So you only see the slide at a reduced uh, size, maybe so they can see their notes better or something. I don't know. Uh, but I've seen people do that as well many times. And so you just made a not ideal situation much worse through the choice of font size, the colors, lack of contrast, the fact that you picked a template where the text is smaller than it has to be, that you're in presenter mode, or sorry, not in presenter mode, but whatever it's called, review mode or, or something, um, editing mode. So I've seen this countless times. And when I say countless, I mean many, many hundreds of talks like this, including talks at major conferences. 
you know, and then someone's pointing with a laser pointer and their hand is shaky and it's going all over the place. And, you know, or, you know, the audience, part of the audience is sitting at some angle. They don't have a clear view of the screen front on, right? So it's just harder to read. So to me, okay, so here's the difference, right? I think a lot of people create their slides with the idea that someone is going to be looking in a dark room, sitting in the middle row with good eyesight, looking at the screen. And my view is someone's sitting off to the side. They're fairly far back. They have poor eyesight. The lights are on. You get this little junky projector that's at an angle with this little portable screen that's not very reflective, and the bulb is burning out. Okay, that, that's my view. And that person should still be able to read what you're doing, if at all possible. Okay, so, um, and, and one thing is people put way, way, way too much text on, on a slide. Or they'll put giant figures with little subcaptions and, you know, uh, all sorts of little text. And they'll put that up and they'll put it up there for like 10 seconds and then they'll move on. And it's like, okay, what was I supposed to get from that other than an eye test? which admittedly I'll fail, um, but that's the whole point. You know, so why are you putting this up there? And so part of it is also that if you're presenting a paper, for example, if you're giving a talk for a paper, you know, the, that talk you're giving is not the paper in the same way that the slideshow is not the talk. You know, your talk is an advertisement for the paper, so people will want to go read your paper. It is not intended to communicate every single idea in this complex technical paper. And so putting on pages of, of formula and a bunch of code in small font and then saying, okay, uh, here's this thing, and then moving on, you know, what's the point of that? It doesn't make any sense. So those are all problems I've seen countless times. You know, I would say I'd, I've seen these sorts of problems like a thousand times or more. I've seen a lot of talks at this point. Classic mistakes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> already, we are, you know, getting into, okay, now we're, now you have a chance of giving a talk that's, that someone cares about, all right, that someone can actually, you know, make sense of. And, you know, at this point, I would say, Maybe tolerable. <laughs> okay, so this one's probably going to be a bit controversial, but I, I think a major problem is someone going into a talk, they assume that the audience has the same background that they're used to. Like uh, PhD students are infamous for this because they've been in a lab talking to a bunch of people who are experts in a certain technique. They assume that everyone knows that this technique's important. They assume everyone knows the buzzwords and everything. And so they start this talk, and by slide three, they've lost everyone. And, you know, uh, uh, it's not even clear why they're doing this thing. They're, they're giving a talk on some complicated technical topic, and uh, they, they don't offer real motivation or motivation to someone who's a non-expert can understand and they're not giving context as they go through the talk. So people get lost. So even if someone did believe that it's important and had some idea of what the problem was being solved by the time they're in slide seven and you know, you get all this math or all this code or compl complicated technical arguments and figures, then the person watching it is like, okay, where are we? What, why are we looking at this thing? So that's the question. Why? Why are we looking at this slide? Why are you talking about that thing? That's the question the audience is going to be constantly asking themselves. Why? 
Why are we talking about this topic? Why should I pay attention to this? Why shouldn't I check my email? Right? Why on slide seven do you have this giant code dump with the font size too small to read? You know, so hopefully we've gotten past that one already. Um, but why are we talking about this topic? Why is it interesting? You know, there are infinitely many topics we could talk about. You know, someone says, hey, I've got a new type system. Great. There are infinitely many type systems. Why are we talking about this type system? What are the problems you're trying to solve? Or what is the interesting, you know, kind of insight that you're bringing? Whatever it is. But what is the motivation? And when we're in the talk, why are, you know, like how is what we're seeing for a particular slide or a particular argument, what is the context of that within the overall motivation for the talk? And, you know, if we're on slide 10 and the argument's super complicated, why are we making this argument again? Why do we need this proof? Why do we need this lemma? You know, what is the reason for this? Why is that critical? How does that fit into the overall argument or story that's being told? That is something where, you know, I almost always feel lost um, in the talk in the middle. It's like, okay, why are we talking about this thing again? That's the question. So if I were developing a talk, I would, I would ask myself at this point in the talk, is it clear to the audience, including people who aren't technical specialists in my area, why we're talking about this? If nothing else, I would hope that someone watching one of my talks could at least understand the motivation. Even if they don't understand all the technical arguments, they should at least understand why I want to do this thing. Okay, that's what I hope. And if I'm in the middle of some complicated technical argument, someone who maybe is technically savvy, but is not following every detail, hopefully can understand why it's important to make this argument to begin with. Or maybe it's a side concern and could be removed. But if that's the case, why am I talking about it? So that's, I'd say, the, the next level. <clears throat> And then, you know, I think I'll stop here. I, I think ideally at least one person in your audience should get something out of the talk that goes beyond, okay, here was a talk, it was on this thing. Um, okay, fine, I will forget that. It was an okay talk and then I will move on, uh, you know, kind of <laughs> with the rest of my day. Hopefully there's at least one person who watches your talk who says, ah, that is incredible or that is beautiful, or that solves a problem, or maybe could solve a problem, or this person has an insight that is really interesting to me, and I want to get involved, or I want to talk to this person, or I want to read about this topic, or I want to play around with the code, or I think this is just beautiful and I'm going to tell other people about it. You know, this has enriched my life just in the sense of, you know, sort of the mystery and and beauty and majesty of mathematics and life, the universe and everything, you know, all those sorts of things. And so this is what I try to get to. Um, and notice I said at least one person, okay? One person is in my mind, a uh, success. Now, What, what I will say is, you know, maybe, maybe there's an aspect of, you know, conveying the key concepts clearly. Okay. Okay. So I'll put this in here and then maybe one more. Okay. So, so fine. Sure. There's one more step, which is all right, if you're clearly expressing the motivation and the context, you also want to make sure that the key ideas um, are expressed clearly, that if you're showing a complicated argument having to do with code, your code is correct, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, you know, I almost forget about this because, you know, my feeling is 
that's probably not where the problem is for most talks. If you've gotten to this point and your, you know, your concepts aren't as clear as they could be, that may just be because you haven't talked about it enough or you haven't done enough work. Keep working on it. That will come over time. And you can talk to people and ask them, where did they get lost? So that's just putting in the work, trying to refine your arguments. If you talk about a topic, if you teach, for example, this in a course you're teaching, you know, maybe the first couple times you teach it, it's pretty confusing. And then the third time is better. And by, say, the fifth time, you know, you've got it down pretty well in terms of you know where people are going to get confused. That's fine. But the first time is probably just going to be kind of confusing. You want to figure it out where people got confused and all the places and so forth. So, you know, this is critical. This is a critical part of it. But here I'd say, well, just just keep trying. Keep trying harder. Okay. Uh, but if you already are expressing the motivation and making sure people can tell where they are in your argument, you know, fine. The concepts, the clarity of the concepts will come through repetition and through reflection. So this part feels actually the easiest probably of all of them. And they're not, not necessarily easy, but that's probably the one where you just put in the work and, and it'll happen. Um, but then, you know, once you can convey the concepts clearly, then the level above that is get at least one person in the audience really excited. That's that's the view that I have. That's what makes something exciting. Now, if you really succeed, it's going to be more than one person. And, you know, it may be that uh, one person is really excited or 10 people are excited. And it may be that some people don't care. Uh, and it may be that some people are like, well, it's kind of nice talk, but it's just not that relevant. And it may be that some people like hate it. Okay, that's fine. You know, if I give a talk and 10 people hate the talk, but one person says this is the greatest talk I've ever given, I mean, ever seen, well, then that's a win in my book. I don't care that 10 people didn't like it. I'm sorry. You will watch another talk soon, I'm sure. You know, sort of like the my next one will be better. Well, hopefully the next talk you watch will not upset you uh, in the same way. But the fact that one person loved it or 10 people loved it, okay, that's what I'm going for. Usually... It's more like one person loved it or 10 people loved it. And a lot of people say, well, that's kind of cute. That's kind of cool. Maybe maybe if someone else is interested in that topic, I'd point them to it. Uh, but then they just kind of go on. So, um, But to me, it's the, um, you know, I, I'm not worried about someone being upset by my talk. I'm worried about someone not caring, about everyone not caring, saying, oh, okay, that's kind of a cute talk, you know, moving on. Uh, that's what I don't like. You know, it's the uh, Neil St Stephen said. Uh, Neil Stevenson says um, he'd rather meet a naysayer than a maysayer. You know, so if the response is meh, you know, th to me that's the response that I don't like. Um, if someone says I hated that talk, it's like okay, well now we can engage in the conversation and see what you didn't like about it. But if someone's like meh, you yeah, know, whatever. Then I, I, you know, that's it. That's like. You know, it's like the opposite of love isn't hate, it's indifference. You know, same same sort of idea. So anyway, that's what I think about when it comes to talk. So, you know, if you can get up, if you can, if you can get up to this level already, you know, get, convey the key concepts clearly, you're doing really, really well. Okay, so that's great. That's already better, I would say, than 95% of talks at conferences. Um, and if you get to this level, at least with some of your talks, well then, you know, then that's special. If, if you think you've reached that level, send your talk to me. Okay. Um, this is something I aim for. I think occasionally I reach this, but I, I aim for it as many talks as I can. Um, and you know, that's the other thing. Give a lot of talks. Well, if I'm aiming for this level and I hit it, 5% of the time, but I give a lot of talks, well, there you go. Then there's at least one person in, you know, one out of 20 of my uh, talks who, who really responded to that talk. And if I give, you know, hundreds or thousands of talks, then it adds up. And then, you know, just because everything's sort of a power law, you know, that means that one of my talks, so it'd be a whole bunch of people who responds to, okay, that responds to it. So, 
anyway, that's um, kind of how how I feel about talks uh, in a nutshell. I could talk about any part of this at, at length, I'm sure. Um, hopefully you'll find at least some of these ideas worth thinking about. And I'll talk to you soon.